So, again, this is all my own prejudice, I'm sorry to say, and I'm going to talk to you about two situations in which you'll be using fecal cow protection and then just touch on, on the third. And the, 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 of those three things, it's not particularly contentious. So, we know, how, we know what fecal cow protection is, cow protection is, how it works, its stability and all of this. Ah, there we are. Thanks very much. So... I want to talk to you about the way we use it to uh, monitor Crohn's disease and how then we use it to help distinguish IBS from IBD, that's DG11, and then I'll just sort of rub it up against the back of the, the fit, and you know how bullies always beat up the little goody two-shoes, so fit's going to win here, but um, we, we just got to think about how the two talk to one another. So, is that okay? So, Crohn's disease. Uh, now, Crohn's disease is managed by gastroenterologists and people like me, and they like to do what they like to do. Uh, and if you're on lab medicine, you'll know that that's how it is. So, there is no consensus about how fecal calprotectin is used in inflammatory bowel disease because each gastroenterologist thinks they do the perfect job, and so they like it their way, and I don't think there is going to be a consensus. IBS with IBD, that's primary care, gastroenterologists aren't interested in that, so there will be more consensus, and I hope I can sell you what we think is a really good um, package. The reason why calprotectin has become important in IBD is that inflammatory bowel disease is now a changed disease. When I was a trainee, it was, a med it was an illness that we couldn't really treat, uh, we just gave therapy until the operation was needed. And so all we did was held the patient until the surgery was required. But biologics have come along and changed everything. And we can now heal Crohn's disease, heal um, osteocolitis, switch off the disease, and this has transformed everything and, and allowed us to think about how we keep people well long term. The reason why calcitectin is useful is that symptoms and disease activity do not correlate. Previously, when we, we weren't bothered about, previously all we could do was respond to symptoms. Now, because we can get complete mucosal healing, we need to know how active the disease is, not how the symptoms are. And so we struggle with patients postoperatively, and we struggle with patients who have IBS and IBD at the same time. How do we handle these? And we poison patients uh, with IBD and we give them horrible drugs or, or too much or too little and so can we use the calprotectin to optimize therapy and can we use it to save money to spare investigations so calprotectin has the potential to be really transformative in the way we manage our patients with inflammatory bowel disease we did a little bit of retrospective work uh, and then uh, audited that, and this is this is the data that came out of this a, a few years ago. And we looked at clinical reports of disease activity, either radiological or endoscopic activity, and looked at how those reports were, were reported. 
and we, in broad terms, identified quiescent Crohn's disease, mildly active, moderately active, and severe Crohn's disease, and we were able to correlate nicely that disease activity with the calprotectin. And we found that 100 was the median for quiescent disease. I'll come back to that number later. From 250 onwards, which was this, this is a logarithmic scale, we saw disease begin to fall out of control. Uh, I hope this slide makes sense to you. What we did then, the numbers are small, forgive me, but that's how it was. We categorised the Crohn's disease activity alongside the mean fecal calprotectin and we co correlated the symptomatology of these patients at that time. So everyone was asymptomatic if they had uh, a calp around 100 or up to 280, which was what we thought was mild disease, and then a higher calprotectin, more symptomatology. It all makes sense. Of course it does. But what we were able to do was, with that data, then look forward and there was a period of review after this time point, 16 months or nine months, and we saw what happened, what came of those patients uh, with that calprotectin. We saw that if you had quiescent disease, you could run a long time and no, very few would come to harm. This patient had a, a fibrotic stricture that needed operating. But if your calprotectin is high, nine months later, uh, you, you've, you've run up against a brick wall. You have active disease that requires intervention. So what that told us was that we could use calprotectin, we thought, based on the numeric, to anticipate, to predict what's going to happen for the future. You know, it makes sense. We know that's what's, what it's going to do. But to demonstrate it, we thought was good. And we presented that in a slightly different way here. So if, we, if you have months of review, 3, 6, 12 months here, and you get, um, uh, you can have two co cohorts of patients, and at three months, if your calprotectin is around 185, you're going to be asymptomatic, almost certainly. But if your calprotectin is 500, you're going to be symptomatic at review. So these numbers were the calprotectin at entry, Three months later, if your calp is 500, you're going to be symptomatic. Uh, six months later, if your calp is 600, you're going to be symptomatic. We thought these were the same, but of course, the asymptomatic calp needs to fall to guarantee you being well in, the, in a year's time. And we're again on that 100 number there. So calprotectin predicts for future flare, and it's better than our old friend, the CRP. Uh, we're talking about patients with calprotectins around 100, 100 to 250. This is the group, 250 to 500. This is the group we're now interested in because we can modify this disease, and only 50% or less would have a raised CRP. So we're suddenly picking up disease earlier than we historically used to when we just relied on the CRP. Okay, happy? Um, I want to talk you through this because this is the, the uh, pathway of care that we now offer based on this data. And what we do is that we establish a patient on uh, a treatment. Um, no, we don't. We do that here. We establish, we establish a patient on their treatment, whatever treatment it is. So it can be biologic or DMARD or post-operative. And then once they're established, and the timeline depends upon that treatment given, so in infliximab, the timeline is shorter, is longer than uh, adalimumab or vedolizumab. Once they're established on their treatment, we then add a, cal uh, a request to fever calprotectin. And if the calprotectin is less than 100, we infer that they have quiescent disease. And we manage them uh, accordingly. We then assess their symptoms. And if they're in clinical remission, we either keep going with, on their therapy, 
or we consider a withdrawal of some of their treatment, uh, presuming either that they we, that they're, they're well in remission and need to stay on that treatment, or that we have the opportunity to withdraw some of that treatment. We check metabolites, and if we make a change, we repeat the calprotectin at three months. Alternatively, if we stay as we are, we just repeat in 12 months, and they roll on for another 12 months. So they don't need to then be seen in the clinic for another 12 months. If the patients have a, a calprotectin less than 100, but they're symptomatic, we treat them as though those symptoms are functional. They've got an irritable bowel. If their symptoms resolve, they continue through this pathway and are followed up at 12 months. If their symptoms persist, they're seen by a clinician. Okay? And then on this side, the calprotectin comes in greater than 250. We think that they're likely to have active disease, but we repeat the test because uh, it's not all, it doesn't always tell the truth. And if the cup comes back greater than 250 a second time, we investigate or we escalate treatment. And then uh, once we've made a change, we review it three months. If the cup protecting comes in less than 250, we follow one of the other pathways. And this intermediate pathway between 100 and 250, again, we treat as though the patient is likely to have quiescent or mild <coughs> disease, but we follow up at six months not at 12 months. Okay, so a traffic light system, high, but not that high, 250, repeated, investigate, less than 100, everything's okay, de-escalate or treat symptomatically, and in between, just see sooner, at, at six months. And um, we've audited that, so we established that pathway and then we rolled it out over a two year period and reviewed the outcomes. Uh, uh, on 132 patients. So all were established on treatment, and none were on short course steroids, and a third had a, uh, a quiescent calprotectin, a third had an active disease calprotectin, and a third were intermediate. And the sorts of patients uh, are just t typical. So all comers, all sorts of patients can be entered into this pathway. 43 were post-operative, 40% were on DMARGs, 25% were on biologics, and 13% were on biologics and DMARD. And we had a high compliance for returning the stool sample because these are patients we're seeing regularly in the clinic. And uh, we found uh, the, the care pathway to be effective. We found that the 250 cutoff predicted for current disease activity with a negative predictive value of 97% and a positive predictive value of 85%. So this, this is particularly important because 70% of those patients at that stage were asymptomatic. So we were able to find patients efficiently uh, and identify their undertreated Crohn's disease and escalate their treatment before they became symptomatic, before they had a flare. And for me, that's been really important. The distribution of the fecal calprotectin, yes, most, 50%, had a calprotectin at the upper limit of the assay we use, at 600. But half had a lower calprotectin, 22% at 400 to 600, and 27%, 250 to 400. And then the flip side applies as well. So, 500, 250 predicted for current disease, but less than 100 predicted for subsequent quiescence. So these patients we didn't investigate, these we did. So this data is based on gold standard investigation, but this data is based on following them a year later and seeing that they remained a, asymptomatic. We, didn't, we, we couldn't justifiably investigate people with quiescent disease. So this pre predicted for quiescence with a positive predicted value of 98% and a negative predictive value of 47%. And we got a great curve from it. So um, your colleagues will be doing something like that, but I think that's fantastic. And I think I don't, I can't encourage my colleagues to use it because they're all doing their own thing. But I, I think that model is very good and, uh, and I, and 
saves ill health. Okay? Um, other papers have produced similar findings. So this is one um, from a Spanish group, and they looked at 119 patients with Crohn's disease, follow-up of just under two years, uh, and they uh, looked only at patients on infliximab, and they added in both the calprotectin and trough levels of infliximab. But they came to the same uh, cutoff value and had a great sense and spec. So, uh, the, as long as you're doing something like this, that's, that's the key message. Okay, so that's Crohn's disease and um, calprotectin. Okay, so far? So this is now uh, calprotectin in the IBS, IBD cohort. So this is how on earth we get this guidance to um, work. And you know, you know this, but how we get uh, fecal calprotectin to work in primary care uh, to uh, identify those likely to have IBS so that they stay in primary care and those likely to have IBD so that we can pull them through and investigate them quickly. And of course, the, the big, big problem was that all of the data that informed this uh, uh, statement was based on secondary care studies where the high, there, there was a high point prevalence of inflammatory bowel disease and it skewed the sense and spec of, of those results and therefore informing that statement. So we've been using fecal calprotectin in secondary care, so this is a pre-selected population for over a, a decade now. And we worked out very, very quickly that calprotectin in secondary care to help a clinician uh, uh, is fantastic. And it had a negative predictive value of 96% and it just misses the sorts of disease you know a non-inflammatory marker, an inflammatory marker is going to miss. It missed Barsop malabsorption, giardiasis. Yes, it could be, be, miss some Crohn's, but usually pancreatitis or celiac disease, the sorts of things that don't cause inflammation. But we found it great and, and, and of course felt that it could be switched into uh, a primary care because of its sensitivity. Uh, the problem with the calprotectin, and you'll know this, wasn't the, the, the normal calprotectin, that's the negative predictive value, it's what on earth we do with a positive faecal calprotectin and what makes a faecal calprotectin positive. And we found in our data that 30% of patients who had IBS had a raised faecal calprotectin. And the mean of that cohort was 160. Um, uh, three times the, the, the standard. We found also that a third of our patients would normalize their fecal calprotectin would normalize if repeated, and it was based on that that we conducted the study that I talked about this morning. And we also knew that raised fecal calprotectin made us fret. Clinicians got abreact to the raised result, and we know that we investigate more than we need to if a result is positive. And preventing unnecessary investigations uh, was uh, a big concern to us. And yet, 20% of patients with ulcerative colitis had a calprotectin less than 200, and 45% had a calprotectin less than 200. So we've got to find a way of, of having our cake and, eat it, and eating it. Uh, this is another pathway. So this is the IBS IBD pathway that I devised, which is also traffic light based and uses the same numbers as we picked up with the active Crohn's disease. And we used a cutoff of less than 100, likely IBS, greater than 250, likely IBD, refer urgently, and 100 to 250, we don't quite know what to do, repeat it and see what happens. And I got some money from NICE uh, 2014, and we piloted this pathway in five GP practices in the Vale of York CCG. Uh, and uh, and it, it worked fine. Uh, and these, this graph summarizes the results from that pilot. And you've got 
four groups here, you've got patients with a calcutex of less than 100, those who had one between 100 and 250, but on repeat it came in less than 100, those 100 to 250 on repeat it remained greater than 100, and those with a calcutex of greater than 250. And the pale bar is the total number of patients uh, uh, evaluated, the dark blue is the total number with IBS, and the, the horrible colour one is the percentage of patients who proved to have organic enteric disease, largely IBD, but not exclusively. And we, I think we've got a really nice curve there. We missed very little disease here and here in the group that picked up almost all of the IBS. And we investigated unnecessarily a small number of patients by comparison, and we picked up all, almost all the disease here. So, uh, this is a breakdown of uh, the percentage of patients, their risk of disease against the cow protecting cutoff. And historically, uh, anything greater than 50 has been taken as abnormal. And the problem with using fecal cow protecting up until this point was this group of patients. So this is easy, 58% come in with their normal calprotectin, they're most unlikely to have anything awful going on. But 50, in the 50 to 100 uh, FC range, you're going to get 30% of patients. And these also are going to have the same risk of disease as this cohort, but all of these would ordinarily get investigated. So what this pathway did, it was effectively to shift this cohort from being false positives to being true negatives. You see? Yeah. And then you're left with the fecal calculation greater than 100, that was only 12%. They had most of the disease and we can investigate these. So our care pathway didn't alter the NPV, but doubled the positive predictive value. And we thought that was great. So, um, um, so I spoke to a chap called Mike Messenger, and Mike Messenger got me on to uh, the, the AHSN, the Academic Health Sciences Network, and they, uh, they were doing some independent work at the time on faecal calprotectin, and it just happened that we both were interested in it, and they have supported me in rolling this modified pathway out across the region. <coughs> And again, if you'd indulge me, I'd like to talk you through this in little detail because this is what we're using and this is what we've evaluated and we think this is very good and you should all be using this, definitely. Okay? So, it's, so the patient comes along to primary care with new onset of lower GI symptoms. That's all it is. They've just got some symptoms and the GP doesn't suspect cancer. We don't impose uh, symptomatology. They don't have to have had uh, pain for this long or change of bowel habit for this long or diarrhea over constipation. Any symptoms, but the GP doesn't think it's cancer. The GP does whatever investigations he or she sees fit. And at the end of that, there is diagnostic uncertainty. If the GP is convinced it's IBS, don't do the test. It's crazy. If they're convinced it's IBD, refer immediately. This is only a risk assessment tool. But if cancer is not suspected and they're not sure what's going on, you do a fecal calp. Okay? If the fecal calp comes in less than 100, they've got a 98% a, a certainty of having IBS, these patients. And we tell the GPs to say that. You've got a 98% chance of having IBS. Treat as NICE tells you to uh, for uh, IBS and see what happens. Or consider other system disease, gynecological disease, urological disease, and, uh, and so manage, manage the symptoms locally. If the patient remains symptomatic and they are young, uh, or the faecal capitation was less than 50, treat again, because their risk is less than 1%. If um, the patient remains symptomatic and they're old, or the calc was greater than 50, you refer routinely at that stage. I should say that this, the inclusion criteria, we go up to the age of 60 with this pathway, okay? And the, the data 
the sentence spec is as robust up to 60 as it is up to 50 or up to 40. If the fecal cupcake is greater than 100, we repeat. If it comes back less than 100, we go through the IBS likely pathway. If it's greater than 100, we refer urgently for a straight to test colonoscopy if it's greater than 250, or routinely to gastroenterology if it's greater, if it's between 100 and 250. So all very simple, all very intuitive, easy for the GPs to use. And what's made it particularly successful is that we've been able to embed this. So uh, the AHSN helped me to engage with stakeholders simultaneously, so we got buy-in from all of these elements with business case support. And then we developed um, patient management systems with System 1 and EMIS so that we could stick that onto what the GPs are seeing um, when they're consulting, when patients are consulting with them. We developed a training package and we made sure compliance was high because we had a secondary care lead who would vet referrals and we issued laboratory guidance to ensure that um, the report tallied the pathway. So the fecal calprotectin result would say less than 100, likely IBS, treat as IBS, or greater than 250, repeat before referral urgently. Okay. Uh, and we um, uh, had local agreements regarding uh, straight to test colonoscopy and we developed a, a GP information leaflet. And we've rolled this pathway out now into, through the Vale of York, Scarborough, uh, Hamilton and Whitby, South Tees, North Kirklees, Wakefield, Bassett Law, um, the East Riding. We just last week got agreement to go with Humber, uh, uh, North East Links and North Links. We've got engagement with Leeds and Bradford, but they're uh, not fully, not, not signed off yet. And then uh, down here, Aylesbury is about to go as well. And our, our rollout of the pathway is fitting with the, our projections we're delighted by. So uh, 85, 88% of patients are coming in with a, a a, a, a low fecal calprotectin. This would be only half if we used a cut for 50, and we're getting about 6% with an intermediate zone and about 9% with a uh, carp greater than 250. And we've evaluated this pathway now. Um, the evaluation is tricky because we don't, we can't investigate all of these patients. So what we've done is we've just followed their outcomes for six months and uh, most patients in York get referred into York. There'll be some loss, some refer privately, some refer to Leeds, but almost all get referred in. So we've just looked for clinical outcomes or clinical activity in the six months after the calprotectin. And we hope, since we've got large numbers, that that will be sufficient, sufficiently robust. The median age is 38. Uh, 63% of female, and the prevalence of IBD, stroke organic enteric disease, is 7%. 53% of fecal calprotectin is normalise if they're elevated, so we insist on the repeat, and the compliance within primary care has been high. And with this pathway, we've achieved a negative predictive value of 99%, and a positive predictive value of 50%, which we're delighted by. These are the sense and spec. This compares with, if we applied the same patients through the historic uh, control, we would have, uh, again, a high negative predictive value, but we drop the positive predictive value from 50% to 16, and that's where the costs would have been lost. And when we compare these, this data with um, a retrospective evaluation, of our patients in Scarborough who had been using calprotectin in an unregulated way in the six months before the pathway, again we see a high negative predictive value but an appalling positive predictive value. And it's this upload from 13 or 16 to 50 that's been pivotal. Okay? So we've done a York, um, we've done a health economic evaluation of this data. Uh, YHEC is a university. Um, 
group who perform health economics, and they've modeled uh, our data on a Department of Health model that they previously developed to look at fecal calprotectin, and they've used historic controls uh, as our comparators. Uh, and we're, we're delighted with this. So this represents uh, what happens if you look at a thousand patients. And the first chart is um, the care pathway described as the intervention versus not having calprotectin available at all and just using clinical judgment and CRP. And for, for a thousand patients tested, we're seeing a saving of a hundred thousand. We're seeing uh, and a reduction of 172, 172 colons. We're getting, uh, 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 yeah, that's what I need to say about that. And if we, more importantly still, if we compare our intervention with a scenario where you're using calprotectin, but with the standard cutoff, the cutoff of 50, forgive me, but if we use 50, the savings are even greater. We're saving 158,000 pounds per 1,000 patients tested. In a population of a million, a population of a million, primary care will be requesting 3,600 calprotectins. So you're going to save 3.6 times 100, so at least um, 360,000 pounds per million population per year, per year, per year. So uh, this brings us back to the sorts of savings that NICE originally anticipated when they brought out the guidelines. And I, I think we found uh, in this pathway the optimal way of um, using calprotectin. I don't think we can improve the sense and spec beyond this. There are lots of interesting things to yet think about, like the, the timing of when you repeat and how other assays work with these cutoffs. So we've just about we're just about to go to Hull and all of our data has come from Bullman assays and Hull have Thermo Fisher. And we've agreed to keep the same cutoffs because we think that the pathway retains a very high sense and spec, even allowing within this zone 50 to 150, even recognizing the differences in the assays between Thermo Fisher and um, Bullman. And the same is likely to happen as this gets piloted in Aylesbury. And in Aylesbury, they use the, di the diasorin assay out of King's. Um, that's just in, in deep discussion at the moment. So we think this is great. And the AHSN nationally is supporting this rollout. Full stop, new paragraph. So very, very briefly, uh, and at the end, um, what I'm really twitched about is uh, that this works for the right population, and it has a very high sense and spec for a biomarker risk assessment tool. And the, the fit threatens to, um, the fit is going to be wonderful and transformative, and may save more money, and may come to make fecal capitation unnecessary. But at the moment, I don't know that to be true. And the positive predictive value of FIT, as far as I can tell, within this low risk cohort is substantially lower than that that we have demonstrated uh, with this pathway. And so I'm, I want us to think very carefully about how the two um, um, interdigitate, interlock, how we rub the two up uh, against each other and get the best out of both tests. Um, uh, and that's why I put that slide up. And I think that's the end. Yes, so that, that was the, the point. So within our pathway, our care pathway, 25% of those patients technically fulfill NICE NG12. And yet we're retaining an excellent sense and spec. So primary care is making the right decision about these patients. And we've got to allow them to continue to do so. I'm most grateful to the HSM, to YHEC, to York Hens Cancer and to Alpha Labs. Again, thank you, that's it.
you stay with us for some questions, please? Questions for the program? Gastroenterologist's left, you see. Ah, okay. It's Ian Woodrow from uh, Mid York's uh, biochemist. Yes. Um, who communicated about the, the GP pathway. It's a question about the Crohn's monitoring, actually. Um, you mentioned about these people calcitectin in, in that. At what stage? Uh, is, is the calcitectin a better marker of, 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 of relapse when they're on biologics than, than monitoring the biologics and the antibodies themselves? I, I think that the two, yes, yes, I think the two are, are different and complementary. So, d disease, the reason I like uh, disease activity and it's the calcitectin. The reason I like the calcitectin so much is that it doesn't matter what medicine you're on, it's inflammation that you're interested in. The difficulty, I think, why we don't get a good lead with calprotectin in, in Crohn's disease is that all the studies, all of the expertise is derived from, from gurus who are running big studies that are paid for by pharma, I think, and they want gold standard investigations, so all it's just not conducive to, to testing fecal calprotectin. But because it looks for inflammation, I don't care how active, I don't care what the score is, how bad the inflammation is, I just want to know whether it's there or not. And any disease modifying therapy will turn down the, the, um, that calprotectin. So once you know that you've not got any, you can then relax your therapies, you can come off dual therapy back onto single therapy, or if the calp is up, you then check your biologic levels, and if they're not good enough, it's not working. Well, it, it, it's a prompt to show that you've developed antibodies, and then you change, or you step up and recapture. Yeah. yeah, it's because, uh, no, uh, no, um, so the, the negative predictive value of the 100 less is poorer, but because you will get, um, you get two things, one, patients fall out of control, so they're on their infliximab and they develop antibodies between one test and the next, and the other is they have stricture in disease, which uh, causes symptoms and which is non-inflammatory. But um, it was just the rationale that repeating a high one because you didn't trust it with a low one in the patient who had symptoms and not. Repeating. Yes, well, that's. I think I, 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 underst I understand. If you if you if you spin it round to the to the second population, that's in primary care, because the. It, it, the, the, the benefit of repeating the test in the higher group, I think, turns on the point prevalence of the disease at that point in time. So in the community, 97% of the time you're going to have IBS, 3% of the time you're going to have IBD. So if you repeat the test, which is raised, uh, uh, because the point prevalence of disease is low, you're going to benefit in the positive predictive value of the test and not lose anything on the negative predictive value of the test. And I assume the same applies in that Crohn's model. So you're more likely to find active disease than you are in that in that raised group than you are in the population who have a than you are to find active disease in the population with a low calprotectin, just because of the the point prevalence of that disease activity. <coughs> Any other questions? Yes. I was wondering, when you compare carbotectins from one day to another on the same patient, do you specify the time of day when they're collected? And it isn't on the same day, it's just... No. No, we make 
no specification. Just keep it nice and simple. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you.